he kind of kept with an older style of painting does not mean that he was not a talented artist. We can tell just in this detail work of these oil paintings that he is incredibly, like he's paying attention to shadow, he's paying attention to detail, he's paying attention to um, very subtle blush in the cheeks, which is a lot of what Leonardo da Vinci did to make his paintings more realistic. Uh, Botticelli is doing the same. Um, and even here you can see just because uh, Venus, this is obviously a detail from one of his works called The Birth of Venus, just because he has a little bit more of a flat style, more of an old style, it doesn't mean that he was not aware of what was happening. And so he's engaging with what was happening in the Italian Renaissance in his own way. So before we get into his religious works, I just want you to know that Botticelli worked from right about the late 15th century to the early 16th century. Um, he was not known for really dating any of his works. All of these works, you know, they have a pretty big span of years of when he probably made them uh, because he didn't really actually, I think he only dated one or two specific works in general. So art historians and historians alike have had to go into, go into his work and see if this was like an older style of Botticelli's or a more new style, more nuanced style for him. And kind of guess on the dates. And so you'll see a big gap when you look at the titles and the dates of these. And although Botticelli is known for his uh, mythology works or his more secular works, he actually did a lot more religious work. At least those are the ones that have survived. And we'll kind of get into some of his mythology, some of the discrepancies with his mythological works where they were additional works could have ended up, la di da. We'll get into that, but right now we want to focus on his religious works. Now, Botticelli was a lot like Michelangelo in the sense that he was very religious. He, um, the church, uh, his faith, very, very important to him. And we'll learn a little bit um, as we go on about his dealings with Savonarola, which was kind of an early, um, kind of what a lot of historians describe as a proto-reformer before the Protestant Reformation really happened. Um, but he was very influenced by him, and he really paid attention to a lot of, uh, he really did have a lot of religious commissions in his life. And so we want to look, a uh, popular subject for him, and we'll see more of them as they come along, is uh, the Madonna and Child motif. Now, Madonna and Child motifs were very, very popular, not just for works in churches, but these were also featured in the homes of various families, particularly wealthy families. But Botticelli, as we'll see, also painted them um, with no commission and would just sell them outright because they were very popular. Now, uh, I am going to bring some attention to this, oops, oops, this figure right here, which would be the Madonna. You'll notice that there are, when you look at the women depicted in Botticelli's work, they honestly look a lot like this face. They don't often deviate. Sometimes they'll have darker hair. Sometimes they may have more lighter hair, but um, they really don't deviate from this. And this is because it's, it's rumored, it was rumored at the time that he used a specific model that he was somewhat infatuated with and was known as this renowned beauty, beauty throughout Florence. Um, but you'll see that the faces are very similar until you get to individual and specific portraits that he did. So, but what you can tell is that Botticelli is really interested in the intimacy found between the Madonna and child. And this is obviously, it's in the title. This is St. John the Baptist. Um, but she, he's very interested in this realistic depiction of the Madonna and child, this realistic, uh, I guess, feeling, you know, it's natural for a child to reach for their mother, just like Leonardo da Vinci, just like Michelangelo, just like Raphael, he's interested in that natural interaction, even though his style does not suggest that he's moving towards a more realistic depiction, he is, though, interested in kind of this, this emotion that's meant to be felt in his paintings, and so really, he's a very significant artist, and, um, he kind of, he experienced a little bit of a revival, um, I want to say right around, I right, think right around the 1890s, historians kind of rediscovered him and kind of became obsessed, and so we'll learn a little bit more about that too. 
and this is a good example of one of his altar pieces. Um, so this is called Sacra Conversazione, which is just, you know, obviously sacred conversations. This was another very popular motif, and this one is very saturated. Um, we, I think Botticelli doesn't get enough credit for just how brilliant of a colorist he was, but he, he was rumored to learn from, um, he was rumored to learn from uh, Filippo Lippi, which, who, some historians claim that Botticelli was trained by him. There's no evidence of that. But Filippo Lippi's work was also very saturated. So we can assume that maybe he was not trained by him, but he was definitely very influenced by him. And so you just will get these, you know, bright reds, bright blues. The Virgin Mary is often donned in this, um, in this specific blue. Uh, this, it, this color became kind of known for her type of color just because it was so pure and it was so rich and it was very expensive at the time so uh really painters only usually use that blue on very significant figures in the painting now his religious works don't always feature um madonna and child motifs or altar mo motifs but they can also figure they also feature certain saints and so we know that saint augustine of course was a, a definite important founder of the church, a very important for church father. Um, he wrote a lot, I mean, you can write, you can go and look up his work. Uh, one of his more popular works is called The City of God, where he talks about um, how the Roman Empire used to treat Christians. Anyway, he was very important in Catholicism, particularly around the time. He was kind of being revived during the Italian Renaissance as well. More and more people were reading his stuff. And a very important saint that a lot of families considered their patron saint was Saint Sebastian. Uh, he was very important because he was martyred for his faith. And we can see kind of that the depiction of that martyr right he, here. He has arrows stuck through him. A little bit gruesome, but uh, these are just part of his iconography and how people would recognize, you know, what saint this was. Um, and you can also see some landscape depictions in the background right there. And so these are, so Botticelli was definitely interested in a lot of, I, I guess what you could call diverse subjects in his religious works. Now, he was particularly known and enjoyed working with it, within this idea of a tondo. And that just means a circular painting, right? A circular wood panel. And these were, um, these were pretty popular, especially in the domestic sphere. And like I said, not all of his work, he, he wasn't commissioned to do a lot of these tondos. He just created them and would sell them later on the market. Now, Botticelli never got super wealthy. Um, he was employed by the Medici family and did some commissions for um, not only the Medici, but the kind of the surrounding powerful families in Florence, but he was never super wealthy. You know, Michelangelo was pretty wealthy. Leonardo da Vinci did pretty well. A lot of the famous painters throughout the Italian Renaissance really were pretty well off. Uh, Botticelli was not, he wasn't necessarily poor, but he wasn't the richest painter in the world. And it's probably because he would make these elaborate paintings and some of them would sell and some of them wouldn't. But um, we do know that they were very popular and he did make money, just not as much as he would make for a commission. But he was very dedicated. Like I said, he was a very religious man, which is what I think inspired him to make this type of work kind of in his spare time and in between commissions. Um, and like I said, you'll start to see this face kind of pop up. Now, this one is a little different, you know, kind of the nose structure is a little different. He is trying to play around with various faces. But um, you'll also see that although some of these boys depicted in this picture, they're angels, but they're also depicted as young boys, um, particularly young Florentine boys, right? Like check out the garb here. Like they're really not very distinct from young Florentine boys at the time. Um, you can see a similarity in these facial features. Now he is trying to experiment with hair color to kind of diversify the types of faces he makes but um, he definitely has a certain style. Just like when you, you can pick out a Michelangelo face and you can usually pick out a Leonardo da Vinci face, uh, Raphael was pretty good at changing it up, but Botticelli does have that characteristic angelic look in all of his figures. Um, and just know that this was very popular at the time to garb um, 
religious figures or supernatural figures like angels and even certain saints or um, de even depictions, you know, of the Christ child, you will find, and even de some depictions of Mary, you will find that they are often garbed in somewhat contemporary or contemporary Florentine clothing found at the time. And that's just to kind of put into context that these figures relate to those people at that time. And a lot of cultures do it. Now, this is Adoration of the Magi. And we believe that actually, I wanna say the Medici um, commissioned this. And so an interesting part about this though, is that Botticelli, that first picture I showed you of Botticelli, he's actually featured right over here in the far right. And he is looking directly at the viewer. Now, this is something that artists would um, often do uh, just to kind of somewhat sign their work um, because not a lot of artists were actually signing their work at the time. But this is how they would actually physically sign it is they would depict themselves as a certain figure and they would take an additional step of making that figure look directly at the viewer. Now, um, it's, it's, very, it's very interesting and we don't, get a, we don't have a lot of portraits of Botticelli and what he looked like at the time. So it's interesting to know, you know, he obviously was a pretty good looking guy, fair hair, all of this stuff. But um, you should know he had a very per close and personal relationship with the Medici. And not only did he paint religious paintings for them, but he also painted portraits and secular works as well. Now, uh, an interesting thing about Botticelli is that he spent almost his whole life, in fact, he did spend his whole life living in Florence, pretty much in the same house that he was born and raised in. Um, and he lived with his brothers, or lived with his brother, um, most of his life. He didn't ever leave Florence. And not that that's necessarily strange, but Leonardo, who was working at the same time as Botticelli, was kind of, you know, bopping around. He would go from Florence to Rome to Milan, back to Florence, back to Milan, um, and most artists in their careers were like that, that they would kind of go all over Italy, and a lot of artists even actually got a little bit more international. Um, we know that Artemisia Genileschi, who was an Italian Baroque painter, was actually one of the first more internationally re renowned painters because she actually, not only did she do work in Italy, but she also did work in Spain and France as well. But um, Botticelli really never left Florence. This is the only time that he ever really left. And it was, this is actually found in the Sistine Chapel on the walls below Michelangelo's ceiling and the, you know, the tunnel. Um, I've just blanked on what that word is, but where his ceiling is, the vault, the vault where his ceiling is, it runs down. And then there's a section that is dividing that from the rest of the walls. And so below that, you'll actually find works from Botticelli and Raphael and other kind of major painters that worked before Michelangelo and his ceiling. So, but they don't get a lot of, uh, they don't get a lot of attention because obviously it's, it's Michelangelo, right? So, um, now Michelangelo's work does interact a little bit with uh, the work from Botticelli and other artists. Um, he was very interested in the story of Moses and he made a lot of distinctions between this idea and concept of salvation between Moses and Noah. And so um, he is working with them, but he is overshadowing them as well, because that's what Michelangelo did. But this is titled The Youth of Moses, um, and it depicts, and it depicts, this is obviously Moses right here, God calling him. This is very popular at the time um, to depict different scenes from their life in one representation. You know, this is a fresco, but it could be in a painting, or it could be in an oil painting, or whatever. Um, but this is just different scenes from his life, and he's obviously identified wearing this yellow um, robe right here. And so it's depicting different scenes from his life because he was a significant patriarch in the Christian faith. And this is titled Lamentation of Christ. Now, lamentation was also a very popular motif in religious works during the time. Um, you'll see a lot of lamentations really pop up. They were very popular in, um, kind of this more medieval style of art, and then they became very popular towards the end of the late Renaissance and going into the Baroque period as well. And so Botticelli is, um, looking at other artists 
and earlier artists as well, just to kind of get an idea of what he's wanting to do with his lamentation. Now, like I said, he's not going into this idea of realistic depictions. You'll find later artists in the 16th century depict Christ with almost um, kind of this uh, dull color of skin. It's just to identify that he really is dead, and it kind of takes the painting into a more realistic depiction of his death. Um, Botticelli has not really done that quite yet. You may see a little bit of color variation in his legs, but for the most part, he's still depicted as kind of this beautiful uh, golden body, right? Um, so Botticelli's style does not mature like Leonardo's does or like Michelangelo's does when he comes later on. Botticelli actually, towards the end of his career, more reverts back to this flatter style. Now, most historians, well, not most historians, about half of them or so, will claim that Botticelli was actually trained as a goldsmith. And, actually, and, you know, goldsmiths work with a more flatter style. You can't really get a lot of dimension in, golds, in um, that art form. Um, so people think that he was trained because his father was a goldsmith. They think that his early artistic career, he was actually trained as a goldsmith, and then he switched over into painting. But uh, we can't be sure of that. We can't be sure if he, that's how he began his career. We can't be sure if he was actually trained in painting at all and then was just influenced by the work of his father. But what we do know is that he was around um, the media of goldsmith or the media of working in gold and kind of being a mini sculptor, you could say. Um, so it may actually explain why he's more comfortable depicting this flatter form. But just because he has a more of a flat, kind of unrealistic form, it doesn't mean that there's not dimension. If you just look at the robes of this angel and the robes of Mary and kind of this, you know, this pose and how her body twists, he is interested in these Renaissance concepts of making the figures have a more realistic presence and have a more bodily presence. But he is keeping with this more gothic style of a flattened landscape, right? Now, even though he's working with a little bit of atmospheric perspect or perspective here, he's really, a lot, of these, a lot of these things are the same size, right? You've got trees over here that are same size as these trees, and these trees are a little smaller, but it's not super convincing, pretty much. So, but he's not really worried about that because this is the style that he became famous for. And it's a reason why a lot of historians became more involved in kind of his revival. Now, um, like I said, he's working in these tondos. Uh, this is called the Magnificat Madonna. But you'll just notice that Botticelli just has a very soft grace in his figures that even though they're a little bit more flattened, there is this idea of the supernatural. There's this heavenly presence. And that was very popular in earlier medieval art and Byzantine art. It kind of made and separated that supernatural plane from our plane here as viewers or their plane there as viewers. It was meant to be a supernatural experience. Even though you'll see a lot of his angels and a lot of certain youths depicted as uh, contemporary Florentines. It is kind of signifying, no, but these, Flore but these people are different. You know, these figures are different. Um, and you've got the San Marco altarpiece here. Now, this, this is an interesting one because um, this whole idea of a second register of heaven right here was pretty old school. Um, Michelangelo kind of reintroduced it in a nuanced form in The Last Judgment where he had different registers of clouds pretty much. Um, but this whole idea that you can see what's happening in heaven and you've got apostles, popes, saints, whoever is depicted. I mean, not just necessarily here, but a lot of people, a lot of individuals would be depicted on the second um, earth plane, right? Earth register instead of the supernatural register. Um, but to know what's going on in heaven, that's very, <clears throat> that's very kind of, I guess what you could say is old school. It was more popular kind of in the early 15th century rather than the later. But Botticelli is still working in that idea and in those concepts. And he's still working in these older styles so much so that it causes Leonardo da Vinci to actually make fun of him and scoff at his landscapes. So 
Leonardo was a bit of a drama queen too. And this is the, this is another altarpiece that he did. Um, we know that the patron definitely requested more of a naturalistic scene. Um, Botticelli is paying a lot of attention, even though these are flattened florals, he is paying attention to certain diversity of florals. Um, and he's paying attention to kind of making a very realistic Christ child. You know, he's kind of made a chunky baby here, like babies are supposed to be. And um, as you can see, you can definitely see, like, you can see the similarity of the faces, and you're definitely going to see it. You know, just think of the birth of Venus face that you saw at the beginning. Probably going to be able to identify all of them. Now, we're kind of going to leave his religious paintings, um, but he definitely... Towards the end of his career, um, he started becoming, like I said, he was a follower of Savonarola. Now, Savonarola was not the most popular guy in the world. And Botticelli's religious paintings and style, especially the ones that he painted for Savonarola, because he was commissioned by him and he would make him paintings just anyway, because Botticelli was a follower of his. His style began to change, and it began it began to become more flat, even than what we've seen. And he kind of began to revert back to this earlier style of medieval art, keeping the amount of detail work. But it was definitely to make a distinction that this is a religious painting, and these are religious figures, and they should be treated with respect, and not the same amount of respect that we just give a regular people in our lives. They shouldn't be depicted as normal people. That was uh, one of Savonarola's biggest concerns, is that all of the religious um, figures that we were featuring, whether it was Christ, whether it was the Virgin, whether it was a saint, um, whoever it was, he complained, Savonarola complained that we're treating these people as if they're just ordinary people, right? They deserve our respect. They deserve to be treated better, pretty much. And she, he actually had a quote that you've turned Mary into a common whore, is what he said. So he was a he was an intense guy, and he wanted to see reform in the church, but Jelly became a follower. Therefore, his style started to shift and change later in his career. But throughout his career, he continued to paint portraits. Now, this is the portrait of Dante. Now, we know Dante as the author of the Divine Comedy. He lived before Botticelli, but Botticelli was a big fan. Um, he even went on to paint a manuscript of Dante's Registry of Hell. And so he, he's definitely a um, big fan of Dante, and Dante was a very important figure, and he actually became a very, very important figure for the later Protestant Reformation as well. Because, and he was also important to Savonarola because essentially he would call out, he called out a lot of popes and kind of the, the evil of indulgences and, and the evil of money in his work, and he called out religious figures, so he did get in a lot of trouble. Now, um, Botticelli did quite a few portraits of these uh, that he, they would just be titled Portrait of a Young Man or Portrait of a Man with the Medal of Cosimo the Elder. Now this is obviously, uh, most likely, this is a family member of the Medici or maybe somebody that had a close relationship with the Medici family that wanted to let them know, oh, listen, I'm a follower of your family, I'll do whatever you need, whatever. The Medici family was were pretty much the de facto rulers of Florence. Now you couldn't come out and say that because Florence was technically a republic at the time, but people wanted to align themselves with the Medici because they were very powerful, very rich, very influential. Um, but you'll definitely notice, um, I hope you're starting to see like what Botticelli faces look like. They're usually angular. There's definitely a fullness in the lips that he pays attention to. He likes to have eye contact. He doesn't paint a lot of pictures. Although he does portraits inside profile, um, a lot of the male portraits, you know, have direct eye contact. Um, he's definitely very interested in the details of the face, even more so than the clothing and even the landscape right in the background. Um, so he's definitely paying attention to make this as unique and personal and identifiable as possible for his patrons. Now, these are two portraits of young men. They're both titled Portrait of a Young Man. <clears throat> and we can kind of see a difference in style, right? We can kind of see that this figure over on the left is a little less personalized, a little less detailed, um, although you still have the angular face, the full lips. Um, 
it's not quite as convincing as this figure on the right. I'm pretty, I'm pretty, um, although I love Botticelli's style, I am pretty partial to this figure, this young boy on the right that we have, because he's definitely painting this for a certain patron, for a specific family. Um, you know, he's got this gorgeous curly hair, but his eyes are making direct contact with the viewer. His nose is more detailed, lips are still full, but you can definitely see the blush in his cheeks, a more angular jaw. Um, the inclusion of the neck is not so hidden from the hair. And so you can definitely see that Botticelli had the talent to make his figures more realistic. A lot of people think like, oh, he just liked this older style because he couldn't do what Leonardo da Vinci was doing at the time. And that's just not true. And we can tell that right here because these, this is a pretty impressive portrait. Um, he was definitely paying attention to a more realistic aspect of the portrait or the, of the person or his art form, but because his style was just a certain style and whether he was trained in that, whether he liked that more, um, it definitely differentiated him from a lot of the painters at the time that were more moving more towards the, this realistic depiction. So he definitely had the skill to do it. He just had a certain style that he adhered to. And of course we had to include the ladies as well. His portraits of women are, um, just very beautiful, very striking, and usually very detailed. Now, we'll go over this a little bit more in our next series of women in art and kind of how the depictions of women have changed throughout time and how female, you know, the popularity of female artists kind of changed them as well. But just know for the Renaissance, a lot of feminist scholars in particular believe that female portraiture was a form of ornamentation. So these wives were, de were more considered ornaments um, which is why they're so detailed. So they were just ornaments of beauty, right? They made the family more beautiful. Now, I don't necessarily always agree with that, but there is a point to be made that women were a bit more objectified at the time. Uh, they were definitely told to kind of like, no, your job is here, your job is home, you're not going to come out into the world and do all these things. Now, you can argue to the extent of that, and I definitely have, but you definitely will find until Leonardo da Vinci, the woman stayed in this side profile while the men looked directly at the viewer. And a lot of people have interpreted that as instead of seeing them as a person, they're really more of an ornamented object. But they are very pretty ornamentations uh, because Botticelli is very skilled, like I said, in creating particularly female faces. And this kind of elongated nose um, and this long neck were very, were considered, you know, components of ideal beauty at the time. And especially, obviously, the more, the blonder hair or the more golden hair definitely was ideal. So, this is Giuliano de' Medici, and he is probably one of my, uh, this is one of my favorite portraits, and he's actually a favorite figure of mine throughout history. Um, but Giuliano de' Medici was part of, obviously, the Medici family. And like we said before, the Medici often commissioned Botticelli and other object, other artists like uh, Lippi and even Filipino Lippi, who was, Fili for, who was Filippo's son, to work with them and work for them. And like I said, they paid a lot of money, but Botticelli didn't get just a ton of commissions by them either. But this is Giuliano. He definitely uh, was a very significant figure and a very powerful figure. Now, we're going to talk about what everybody's been waiting for probably, the mythology aspect. Now, we talked a little bit about Botticelli's Birth of Venus and Primavera in our previous mythology and art lecture. So we're gonna go over some of his less famous mythological works. Botticelli was known even back then for his you know, kind of very gorgeous renditions of secularized work. Now we know that in the Renaissance, these secular works were very important to the people because there was this revival of classicism, of classical antiquity. And when you revive antiquity, you revive all the philosophers. And when you revive all the philosophers, you revive all the, po the poets. And when you revive the poets, you get what? Mythology. So, and you get a revival of their religion. Now, people weren't worshiping them, but they definitely saw similarities between their religion, you know, Catholicism and Christianity at the time, to what was even being taught in some of these more secular mythologies as well. Now this is Paulus or Pallas or however you want to say it, and the centaur. 
Um, and you can definitely see there are going to be some similarities with this figure and the way she's dressed and the way she's dressed um, seen in kind of the three graces of Botticelli's Primavera. But um, yeah, he's definitely interested in mythological subjects. This is the story of Lucretia. And this is really fun because this idea of architecture was very popular to depict in even in religious paintings. And this idea of classical architecture being depicted in paintings, particularly religious paintings, not necessarily secular, was kind of this understanding of power, right? It was power, it was monumentality, and it was authority, because there was a lot of authority to be found in class in uh, antiquity as well. And so this, you know, churches would often commission certain religious figures standing in architectural uh, settings like this. Now, this is obviously a secular story of Lucretia. Now, I don't know if you know a lot about Lucretia, but she committed suicide after she was raped. And she's kind of upheld as this, you know, patroness of virtue and that she couldn't live on with her life. And it's a not that great of a story. But, um, <laughs> I mean, maybe you like it. I don't know. But they're definitely in this setting, this kind of Roman antiquity setting for a reason, because that's where this story, not necessarily what this story would play out, but they are kind of making, Botticelli is making a nod towards classical antiquity at the time. And um, you can kind of see this idea of this flatter style that he's, that he's kind of uh, diving into. You know, this is right around uh, the, 16th, the beginning of the 16th century. And even though this is a secular work and not one of his religious works, it is a bit more flat than what we've seen. Now he could be going off the architecture. He, there could be a lot of things that he's doing, um, but these figures are a bit more flat and this is kind of what his style devolves into. Now this is a, another work and I included it because you get to see another um, kind of archi architectural setting. We kind of went over Raphael's School of Athens, but these architectural settings like I said, not only provide stability to the painting because they're so balanced, um, but they also provide this, this air of erudition as well. So not only are they powerful and monumental, but it also means that the patron is scholarly, right? They're an erudite. They, they know what they're talking about. They're very knowledgeable. They're rich, so they're educated. Um, so that's really, the architectural settings are very important. Now this naked figure over here is, uh, does it remind you of anyone? Uh, Venus perhaps? Um, like I said, you can definitely see Botticelli's figures versus other figures. Now, of course, I had to tell you a little bit about the birth of Venus and we'll end on Primavera after I tell you a little bit about the tragic story of the burning of Florence during Savonarola's time. But, um, We've, we went over the birth of Venus a little bit, but as you can see, these figures are very similar, right? This, this naked figure to the far left, this nude figure of Venus. Botticelli is not afraid to reincorporate similar styles of figures in his work. Now, it is interesting to note that these works are not, these works are very monumental. This one, most likely, and actually his Primavera, most likely were commissioned for a wedding. There's definitely overt sexuality in these works, and they were probably commissioned to actually be put onto pieces of furniture. Primavera was actually probably going to be, was probably commissioned to put, to go on this idea of a, of a day bed. And it, it was meant to inspire, um, it was meant to inspire love, right? Love making, having kids, uh, the marriage bond. It's meant to inspire all those things because it was thought that if you thought on these things and you would be more fertile, right? And fertility brings heirs, all this stuff. People, heirs inherit what their parents give them, la -dee -da. So it was definitely, we, most scholars believe that both the birth of Venus and Primavera were uh, commissioned for the celebration of a wedding and definitely an important wedding, perhaps Primavera is thought to be for a Medici wedding, in, or specifically, we don't know much about whether the birth of Venus, what family it would have been for, but we do know that they were pretty wealthy at the time. And we've gone over Primavera as well, but as you can see, this kind of, this delicate, transparent, um, kind of gossamer fabric 
very popular in his secular work. He would not include this in his religious works, right? Because Savonarola was like, you can't liken Mary to one of these, you know, common, you know, fake goddesses, right? But uh, Botticelli was definitely interested in um, depicting these secular figures pretty much until Savonarola really got a hold of him. Now, the tragic part, um, which we're going to end on sad news, <laughs> The tragic part about Botticelli is that a lot of historians believed he did more of this type of style in his mythological works. But we believe that at least two were destroyed in kind of this great purge that Savonarola did over Florence. Savonarola had so many followers that eventually it kind of came to this great book burning, art burning, um, you name it. A lot of things were burned at the time that represented kind of idolatry, this idea of idolatry. And a lot of historians believe that at least two or three Botticelli paintings were actually thrown into that fire. Not all, but a lot like to assume because we don't have a lot of his mythology paintings left. And because the birth of Venus and Primavera are so mature and so well done, we believe that this, these were not his first mythological works. But because Botticelli was a follower, he wanted to respect Savonarola, and so it's thought that he actually put two of his own paintings into the fire. So we've lost some probably pretty significant Botticelli paintings throughout history, but that is life and that is, you know, kind of the woes of art historical study. Um, so I hope you've learned that um, Botticelli was a very interesting character, very, very religious. He quit making secular paintings towards later, later on in his career after he started following Savonarola. And then even his religious paintings started to change in style, form, and even subject matter um, because of what Savonarola was teaching at the time. So I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about Botticelli and his life. And if you have any questions, now's the time to ask them. Dina, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I was wondering if if there are any subjects that they had to stay away from, like if they get in trouble for painting certain things in that time. Well, any taboos, you might say. Yeah. Um, so depictions of God the Father were very rare uh, because it was thought that, you know, he was too holy of a figure, essentially. And so depictions of Christ became very popular because he was man, you know, man come to earth in the incarnation. So there was that earthly element. Um, but you didn't necessarily get in trouble for that, although it was kind of a, hmm, that's kind of interesting. So it never became super popular. What you can really get in trouble for were, I mean, you couldn't do, I want to be careful with how I say this, but, you know, a lot of contemporary artists, especially kind of when you think of edgy contemporary artists, do overtly sexual or have overt sexuality in their work you would not find that in the renaissance you'll see a nod you'll see a nude but you won't see two people entangled or anything like that so you had to stay away from that um you could you could assume you could have them lying together like in a field like that was pretty popular um but you had to stay away from overt sexuality right you had to more like do innuendos and you really got that in more like secular works. Um, but if you, if there was a hint of a sexual, sexualizing uh, the virgin, in a sense, that was pretty frowned upon too. Um, there was a lot of criticism, I think even in Michelangelo's works, um, that the virgin was a little, was far too sexual in the sense of you know, and that's where kind of, you know, what Savonarola was fighting against is that you've likened Mary to this whore, right? Like, you've made her more secular than she is holy. And so they had to stay away from that. As in terms of real, like, bad subject matter, um, not really, not really anything was totally off limits, but you got to understand there were standards, standards of decorum at the time, too. 
And so maybe the subject matter wasn't necessarily limited, but how you depicted that subject matter was limited. So hope that helps. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Oh, I'll go again. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess someone had to be quite wealthy to have a commission done. Is that typical or? Yeah. And how, and how long do they usually take? They take months or, you know? Uh, actually, a lot of these took probably about a year. And you'll actually find that a lot of Leonardo's works took upwards to five, six years. Uh -huh. um, so really, it, yeah, he got in a lot of trouble from his patrons. Um, but yeah, it, it just depends. Uh, but most took, yeah, most would probably take, I would want to say maybe six months to a year because you've got to, like this, this Primavera painting is, I want to say, uh, it's pretty big. I mean, it's, I've seen it in person and I can't remember the exact feet, the exact footage, but it might be like seven by eight or, you know, eight by 10 feet tall. Oh. Um, and a lot of these went on altars. And so they had to be just enormous. You're getting like 14, 15 feet tall because they had to be seen by the congregation or the public at the time. So oh. because they're so large, they would probably take a year or so. And some, oh. some took longer. Well, that's interesting. Thank you. Yeah. I think that's, um, so Cheryl... Uh, she asked, the same, I think she asked the same question. She says, how about the, the large, um, how large are these paintings? So can you kind of break that down a little bit? I know that you said, you know, a couple of them were. Yeah, so Primavera and Birth of Venus are roughly the same size. I want to say they're, they're probably like eight by 10. They're a little wider than they are um, height wise. Um, now, all of body by 10, are you talking about inches or feet? Oh, that's feet. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Not many people did miniatures at this time. Some did, some artists did, but usually you'll, you know, if you're thinking about um, Leonardo's uh, Mona Lisa, you know, that's pretty small. You know, that's not very big at all. I mean, it's this, this. But um, a lot of these religious works in particular, now the portraits are going to be a little smaller. They might be three feet by three feet. Uh, you might get a little bigger. But these altar pieces, um, particularly things, particularly this San Marco altarpiece, that's getting into, I mean, they, it probably varies in between 12 to 15, 16, 17 feet, depending. So most of these are very, most of the religious works are very large. And this is a, um, the Youth of Moses is a fresco. So that's even larger, you know, that could be on a 25 foot tall wall. Very cool. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense because, you know, like when we're looking at the the slide, we're like, oh, yeah. Yeah, they're just many. Many, many. Why, why would it take this artist any time at all to make such a thing? Yeah. All right, so does anybody else have any questions? Yeah, let me ask you, um, are most of these paintings in museums? collections and any idea what's the value because I've been to lots of museums around the world and I love checking out the art but you never see a value and I know they always say priceless you know what does that actually translate to yeah so Botticelli's work easily goes into the millions a lot of these works are in um, museums now you'll find a lot of them kind of scattered throughout Florence Rome you'll even see some I think France has a couple um but some of these major works, I want to say there was a Botticelli that just sold, and I want to get it right. Hold on, let me look. Yeah, so Sotheby sold Botticelli's 1480 portrait young man holding a roundel for 92.2 million. And that was just recently. So that kind of gives you an idea of... I missed out on that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And unfortunately, that was probably, uh, since a museum, I don't know of any museum that can afford that, not even, you know, hotshot ones. Um, that's probably a private patron, so unfortunately, we probably won't be able to get to see it. <laughs> but um, yeah, a lot of these, 
his most significant works, I would say. So I'm thinking of probably, you know, Primavera and um, Birth of Venus are his most popular works, this Castello Annunciation. These are in museums though. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so we have another yeah. question. Um, so because of the size and how, how do you think they were created? Were they, do you know if they were with ladders or like did they have to, you know, get boards and ropes and, you know, pull themselves up to the, the top of them? What do you think? Yeah, you interesting question. Um, I would say there's probably a little bit of both. So Botticelli, um, like most artists, had a type of studio set up. So he usually was working with assistants as well. Um, so if you're looking at, let's say, let's just look at this San Bernaba altarpiece right here. Most likely his assistants filled in some of the coloring of these robes, um, even did, they may have been responsible for all of the florals that he did. The importance in these artists is that they came up with their own design, even though they didn't paint the whole thing, these were their designs. And that's, that was the importance of artists at the time. That's what really set them above, you know, certain other certain artists was this, this aspect of design. So Raphael was good at design Michelangelo, why he became so popular is because he was known for his disegno, which just means that he came up with these elaborate but balanced compositions that really a lot of artists could not come up with. Um, so yes, they employ ladders. Yes, they probably had boards with rope. Um, you know, when you think of Michelangelo, he was on, uh, he was pretty much on scaffolding, painting the Sistine ceiling and had to lie on his back. And then he would complain. He's like, oh, I got the worst neck cramps ever. You know, he was kind of a drama queen about it, but we'll allow him to be because we can assume that that was a tough job. Um, so yes, anything that would assist them in getting up there, they probably used. So is it very common for them to have had assistance helping them with doing the paintings? Yes. Really? Uh, yeah, Raphael was actually, he had a whole uh, workshop of young, young assistants that he was oh. teaching at the time. Uh, varying from 10 to 15 to 20, um, kind of like what Andy Warhol was kind of known for. He ran this workshop of just people in and out all the time, and he made the designs, but they kind of produced it in a sense. And so artists would come and do, Botticelli would obviously, I think Botticelli was probably more involved, um, and Raphael and all these big names, they were very involved with their work. I don't want you to think that they weren't, but there were certain details that their assistants most likely filled in. Um, that weren't the main, um, wasn't the main concept or the main subject. You know, when they start paintings, do they do a sketch or they just start painting? What do we know? They would, so it was, it was a transfer. So most artists worked with a variation of charcoal or even maybe some lead, but they would transfer, they would do these designs and usually transfer them over to the canvas. Um, which means that they would sketch in a large sheet of paper or cloth what their design was and then pretty much stick it to the canvas and transfer it that way. But a lot, uh, but there were different techniques. Um, sometimes that, you know, you'll find in Leonardo's sketchbooks, there were sketches everywhere, but he eventually would have to take those sketch, multiply them in size, and then, you know, kind of uh, mirror that sketch or put that sketch somehow onto the main work. Thank you, appreciate all your time. It's a good way to spend a Thursday night, thank you. Good, good, I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. Botticelli is definitely one of my favorite artists and he gets a little bit of flack for having this older style, um, but I think that's really what differentiates him from what others were doing at the time and I think he needs, I'm glad he gets a lot of, I'm glad that his painting sold for so much because that tells me that, you know, people really do, there is something about this style, this more supernatural, uh, more graceful style that we see um, that was, that kind of came from the medieval period that Botticelli kept. Um, and I'm glad that he did. Lisa, did you have a question? 
I think I interrupted somebody when I was. Did I just wondered on the the Primavera? It looks like there may be a story in that one where the the figure on the right is blue in color. Let's. You don't know if that might represent a spirit or a <clears throat> death. Oh. Or... Yes. So this is actually uh, his title is Zephyr. He was a Roman god of wind. I want to say I think it was wind. Um, and this is him kidnapping Chloris to make Chloris his wife, and Chloris turns into the goddess of spring. Um, so this is actually a god, right, or a Roman yeah. god. And so he's blue because of kind of wind, air, cold. Yeah, okay. Those associations, yeah, yeah. yeah good question, though. That's a good question. All right, anybody else? Okay, so thank you, Samantha. We appreciate you. Um, so next week we do have, a, every Thursday we have something going on. Um, next week we have uh, what we call Explore Arkansas Art. And we have Marjorie Williams Smith. And um, we're gonna look at her art and she's gonna give a lecture over it. And then the following week, we will start with Samantha again over women's in the art, and it's a series. Um, so it's a two-part series. So it'll be on the, I think, February 11th and the 28th. Um, so yeah, so just look out for that. You can uh, look at it on Facebook, or um, you can find us on our webpage and register for them. Um, the, art, the Explore Arkansas Art is pretty new. Um, you know, we started in January and we've had a lot of, a lot of people interested in it. So, um, yeah, it's, it's very cool. Both of our programs are doing so well. And uh, Sam is the one that does the, the lecture live. So, yeah, if you ever have any questions or if you have any ideas that are things that you want her to discuss, uh, you can just send them to us. You can get it on our website and find that information to send it to us and we would gladly have her research and and find that since she's our our curator so we appreciate you guys being here tonight so thank you